This cantilever is balanced and it's on a release arm. It's locked in. And if it was slightly out of balance, it would come down. Would that guy be able to see that, fire stick? So they tear, these trash trucks, these moving trucks, and these cement trucks tear fire escapes down all the time because they can't see them. And if they're out of balance and slightly dangling down, they clip them and they drop them. Now look how close he gets to that one. Do you see the chain there? Does that look like original hardware? Or an add-on? Okay. So now, trash truck, cement trucks. Oh, how about these things? You guys ever work with one of these things? Fire towers? You guys ever train on fire towers? This fire tower is in Waltham, Massachusetts. They asked me to come in. I usually inspect fire towers for free, by the way, for this purpose, because we do a lot of these classes. And a lot of times, at the end of this class, if you'd like, the tower's right here. I'd love to go outside, and we'll do a training inspection right on the tower. Is the tower fairly new or is it an older tower? Perfect. And it has a fire escape on it? Okay. So at the end of this class, if you wish, with whether it's one or two or all of you, we'll videotape it, we'll inspect the tower. So I inspected this tower after a class. And guess what I found? As I hammer tested all the tracks that the guys, the rookies train on every day, they all started falling. Let's see. That's the falling treads. Look how much rust on the inside stair that they have, that they constantly feed it with water every day. Look at the rust on the gussets. Basically, we took this fire escape offline. They lost that tower that day. Look how much rust is on these connections. This is a city hall. See the missing tracks? So somebody here talked to me about their city hall, that they're on top. You're not immune. Firefighters, you know, basket child of egress is, is everybody's problem. Well, firefighters don't look at it. City officials don't look at them. Uh, owners and tenants don't look at them. Institutions don't look at them because they're out of sight, out of mind. And when they were first originally built, they did last 25 to 50 years unchecked. Nothing ever occurred. We've exceeded that now. We're now 50, 75, and in some cases, 100-year-old structure that's never been refurbished in its life. The only cure right now that comes out of your mouth, as soon as anybody talks about a fire escape that you haven't even seen, haven't even looked at, didn't even know was there, what's the only cure immediately out of your mouth? First word. What do you want? Structural Use the dirty word. What's the dirty word? Give me a load test. Then let people stop talking. Is there anything else I can do beside a load test? Is the word load test equal to guarantee? Is that a guarantee for you? That's a guarantee, right? And if they say, can I do anything else but load test it? They say, sure. Have your structural engineer generate a plan with me, and if he can satisfy me that you're taking this seriously and this thing has been refurbished, I want one of, other, one of two other things. You can spot repair it if you really love your old bolts. So I want it spot repaired and load tested. Or if you refurbish these 50 to 75 year old bolts, like you did your roof and your windows and your door and your boiler in the, in the building, and your sprinklers, and you know, you'll just rattle all these things. He says, I think this babe, this bastard child needs a little bit of attention right now, and uh, I will forego the load test if you give me what? A full refurbishment. And if they replace it, any load test required? 100% replacement. They need a load test? No, because the engineer has already given you the documentation through the permit process. Yes? Uh, during the refurbishment, on the step tracks, yeah. uh, the thickness of the, the metal which the bolt goes through, if that's degraded, um, yeah. do you Very have, rare. have to replace the stair? Of course, yeah. Any any tread that's bad, but you're going to find fire skates are very forgiving, and a lot of times it takes a quarter, a quarter inch piece of steel will grow to one inch of rust. Okay, that's how much. Uh, you're, you're going to get. So a lot of times when you have rust between the connection, when you clean it, there's still plenty of meat left. You still have 80-85% left of all the steel that's still there. Even though it looked like a lot of rust, it ate very little of the metal because rust is four or five times the size of the actual piece. And it never gets that. So, and your structural <coughs> engineer answers that. He will replace certain components, including treads or stringers, if they're all eaten through.
Here's your other big question, guys, right? This is the I can't see it, right? So I have, this is actually in a 20-story building in Chicago, and it passed the visual inspection. But then one of the structural engineers says, you know what, let's do some spot inspecting, and let's open, let's have the mason blow out some of these bricks. And he did. This veneer is not structural. See this veneer right here? That's, that's just the skin of your building. You can use vinyl, you can use clapboard, you can use brick. Where this fire escape ties into is this other thing called a masonry wall on the inside of your veneer. That's what I'm tied into. I go through the veneer. The veneer, is, the veneer is not structural. This is structural. But when the parapet wall has a hole in it for 50, 75 years and it leaks down, it leaks down between. See that little cavity right there? Which is usually a half inch or three quarters between the veneer and the, uh, and the masonry wall. And it has these little clips that hold the wall in place. The wall is nothing but a skin. But when the water's coming from the roof for 50 to 75 years, guess what it eats? It eats the inside. Look how fresh and beautiful that steel outside looks. See all these dragon tears over here? See all this rusty, can, rust? Uh, that's a telltale sign that stuff is going on inside and, and, it, and it leaked out. It tears itself out. But until you open this baby up, I can't verify it. And then if I open it up, I find nightmares. Guess what we have to do? Now we've got other problems and other things. And this is two to 400 bucks a piece to have a mason do this, because he has to put the bricks back beautifully and two to 400 bucks per connection. If I take the same connection here and about five inches away, I drill a three quarter hole, eight to 12 inches deep, put an epoxy bolt by Hilti or some other top brand name company, verify that the hole is properly connected. But again, I'm, I've got 12 of them I'm putting in. Even if one fails, the fire escape is not gonna fall down but I epoxy bolt them in. And then I mechanically fasten this epoxy, this bolt back to the clip. The cement one that I had, that I saw some rusty tears and stuff like that, I basically packed it and I left it and I seal it so no more water gets in there. So I let sleeping dogs lie. But do I need that connection anyway? If I have a brand new epoxy bolt, three quarter, eight to 12 inches buried into the wall with, with, with engineer oversight? So, I'm only burying and letting the sleeping dogs lie because the building is 75 to 100 years old. If I want trouble, I just have to keep looking. But if I reconnect it, which is only about 2 to 3% of the entire structure of a fire escape is inside the wall, I just nullify it. I nullify the need to load test it because uh, I put in new, new epoxy bolts. So I say, please, Mr. Inspector, I've nullified the inspect the the connections into the building with new epoxy bolts or new pressure plates sandwiches with a plate on the inside. And every bolt on this fire escape, which is 50 to 75 years old, I've changed every bolt out. I've also signed on the document that there's no rust in any one of my connections and any connections that we did open up and that we have, we sealed it with 50 year silicone. Please, Mr. Inspector, can we avoid the load test for my client? Your answer should be, have you been satisfied? Now this thing is back to a new line in the sand, day one, and it's fully painted. So that's all we're talking about every time we have one of these classes. You guys need guarantees. Load test will get you guaranteed. What else will get you guaranteed now? Spot repair and load test is getting good. What else will satisfy you? I don't want to do the load test. It's too expensive on this building. What else can we do? Refurbish it, seal all the connections. What about the wall? What am I going to do with the wall? Verify or duplicate. Verification, let's see what that looks like. Let me drill some holes in it. Look at all I have to do. The same three quarter drill, I have to drill not one, but sometimes two holes. So I can stick the snake down the thing and look at these connections and verify a piece of steel stuck, stuck inside to the best of my ability. Why don't I just take that same drill and about five inches over there, drill the same three quarter hole, throw an epoxy bolt in there, eight to 12 inches deep, so I'm picking up the masonry wall, re-clip it back to pick up this angle with whatever angle clip I can devise, make, or generate, 
keep the original and make sure it's packed, which that one was anyway. There was nothing wrong with this one, but you needed verification or load test it or verify it. So I went, this is that California craziness. And uh, oh, there's some other stuff inside. This looks like the inside of a horror chamber. I, I don't know what I'm looking at. I, you know, but I needed to photograph and verify. Wouldn't it just be cheaper to duplicate the connection? Because those you can do for about 50 bucks a whack. Make sense? So, this is the plate on the inside. What is that, the plate for your epoxy ball? No, uh, I'm going to show you in a second, but um, there's only two ways for you to, epoxy, to, for you to have epoxy to stick to a building. Three, three ways, actually. The first one is the most simplest one, legs to the ground. So you just lag bolt it back to the building. The building is a leg, the leg is a leg, you have a little bridge in between. That's a fire escape. You see a lot of those, which is just legs to the ground. The next one is now, uh, the fire escape is attached to the wall in some way. If it's a masonry wall, it's usually cemented into a pocket, and I'll show you that. If it's a wood structure, it's got to have a plate, because you have to have a sandwich. A plate on the inside picking up studs, the nut on the outside picking up the, the support. That's the only three ways you ever have a fire escape done. Occasionally, on some masonry buildings, they came through, which I've mentioned before, showed a plate on a masonry building. That's not a very uh, a normal occurrence. Normally, it's cemented in, you can never see it from the inside. But every now and then, you got this plate. It's just an abnormality, but it's acceptable, meaning a masonry wall that some guy just blew a hole all the way through, and because the wall was open, you know, a lot of times my walls on the inside are, are not exposed like this is. You know, there's walls there, there's sheetrock there, there's cabinets there, and it's faster for me to get on the outside and just put a new epoxy bolt, be done with it. But in some mill buildings, I'll have full exposed interiors, and it's just a, give me a through bolt and put a plate. Okay. We're doing a job over there, uh, we're not doing, we're watching a job in Rollinsford, uh, New Hampshire. And one of the mills right down in the downtown. And they're through bolting everything. Okay. This is a little bit of a low tech. I needed almost 3,000 pounds. I used the back of a truck which weighed 7,000 pounds. I had a cable that went through the building, through every one of these, and then it plated. And it strategically had that angle going across so that I was able to pull on this cable 3,000 pounds. And how did I do that? I did that with a chain fall. 10 stories. Everyone had to be measured and taped and photographed and videotaped. You know how much money of that buys bolts or paint for the client? None of it. So that's why load tests, you know, are not the most uh, economical way of, of taking care of your fire escapes. You've got to repeat that every five years. But now, let's see a little bit of uh, the noise that's associated with, you know, all the measuring can't deflect more than 3 sixteenths of an inch, and I got to put that on my criteria to you. And guess what? Stop lifting the tail of a truck. Now, if this thing fails, who's going to get cocked in the head? The guy without a hat. Well, we were thinking about what we were doing the uh, ninth floor. <laughs> but prior to that, a good observation because there's the hard hats that we're supposed to be wearing. But again, it's very dangerous work. But that's why you load it with 40% first and then the remaining 60% because you got to check for deflection. Any pops, any noise. This is us in communication with our. Uh, with our um, uh, engineers who, who have given us the oversight of what needs to be done. So we were actually live video feeding this to the engineers back in their office. All basically to verify this. Missing pieces of a fire escape. Fire escape that you can't get through. This is a fire escape case that we did where a fireman f uh, basically fell through. He was supposed to go to that third floor. He fell through the, I believe it was this staircase right there. Three, two or three steps gave way right there. 27 year old fireman, fell through, went back up, got the woman and the child out. Then by the time he was all done, he had severely uh, injured his spine, done. The uniqueness about this case is that this wasn't a disability case. This became a case where he sued the owner directly for negligence. Because he didn't get hurt during a routine accident of a work-related activity, he got her because the owner had maintained this fire escape for over 25 years. Is that an accident or negligence? He was able to go in and sue the owner directly and all his assets, and they quickly settled. When we got there a year, two years later to do this final inspection, 
basically what we found is that the fire escape, the rest of the fire escape was in the same condition as the original accident date, but those two or three steps that he fell through were rebolted. They quickly settled after that inspection, but from it came this great class. Let me give you a quick lesson on how rust grows. I'm about to prove to you that when you get to a fire escape, that it rusts from the inside out, not from the outside in. If I can prove that to you, that every time you walk up to a fire escape and it's got a lot of rust on it, it's going to take at least 25 years of unchecked, unpainted activity for a fire escape to get fully rusted. So if you get to a fire escape and it's fully rusted, I'm going to show you how you can, on, you can say because of a class that every connection on that fire escape has been compromised and it now can only be verified in one of two ways. The first one is, the dirty word you had to say? Low tested. And the second way is refurbishment. And who's going to tell you that? Your structural engineer, because you're not touching this thing. The owner's not touching this thing. The owner's nephew, cousin, friend, who knows a lot about structural things, right? You want to low test it or you want it refurbished? Because the fact that he's let it rust for 25 years, has he, is every, coin, is every fire safe connection on that, on that building compromised now? To what degree? I don't know. That's what the engineer is going to tell me. But I can know what you low test it to what degree, but that's what the structural engineer will work out with me. So now let's talk about the, the life cycle of rust. Every fire escape in the world, every piece of steel in the world, every bridge in the world got put together with 20 foot lengths of steel, kept to a certain size, and then those two pieces got put together. They got put together because somebody popped a hole between the two and they attached it with a rivet when it was 100 years ago, and then they started attaching it with square bolts 75 years ago. Do you think they painted the two pieces of steel before they put them together? You guys ever sweat a copper pipe with a, with a bull torch? Does it look like it's wet when you start hitting it? Steel is wet. There's moisture. So whenever you put two pieces of steel together, pop a hole through it, put a bolt or a rivet on it, and then you paint it all around, where's the only unprotected piece of steel? In between. Now, as the temperature every day, as you get heat and moisture, do you think that starts sweating on the inside there? That sweat turns into rust. All the rust needs is air and water. What's it getting when you put two pieces of steel together? It gets air and water. So how do you stop it from getting any air? You seal it up with what 100 years ago? Paint. So as long as you keep it painted, it'll never get the second thing it needs to grow rust, and that is air. So 100 years ago, 75 years ago, you're supposed to keep your fire escape painted on average every three to five years, have they? Every seal on a fire escape has broken, allowing air to get to those unprotected pieces. So that's what you have here. Whenever you have pieces, and that's a paint job right there, okay, a little bit of surface rust gets in there. It's trying to break in because the, 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 it's uh, the seal cracked of the paint. What you were supposed to do 50, 75, 100 years ago is lightly wire brush it and do what every three to five years? Paint it, creating the seal. Did anybody do that 50, 75 years ago? No. So they let it go to the next phase. You basically painted over the rust that was there. It was light surface rust anyway, right? So I'm sure this, this glob of paint I'm gonna throw on it is gonna do what? Seal it, right? So what happens whenever you paint rust? The rust eats the paint. So the first thing that cracks again is the joint that you thought you were taking care of but nobody wire brushed it. And all of a sudden now that rust went and did what all the way through the entire connection of the tray. It's got a sixteenth or an eighth of rust all the way down. Is that connection compromised? The, the shaft is still there, 50, 75, 100 years ago, the shaft is still there. Will it fall with that one sixteenth and one, that one eighth in there? No. Got a piece of shaft. I could put a piece of wood in there and it won't let the thing. It's a block. But I've got an eighth, a sixteenth. So, you know, about 50 years ago, were you safe on fire escapes that had rust in the strike connections? Were you safe? You bet your ass. Was. So nobody was really, well, I see a little bit of rust, but man, this thing is solid. So, fast forward another 25 years. Uh-oh. Now we're 
50 to 75 years later, which is today, there's a quarter of inch of rust in there. And that rivet is only so long. It's only 3 eighths long, and you already pushed it away from itself quarter inch or more. So you're dangling, all, all this piece of angle needs is that piece of angle to hit a little bit of that rivet. But it's already been pushed out. That's why if you ask me, you know, do you care about what bolt you use, whether it's, you know, stainless, whether it's, uh, you know, a rated bolt? No, because what kills a bolt is the fact that it, the, the iron is eaten, and as soon as you push it away from the bolt shaft, the tread wants to, get, wants to pass through. That's your problem, not the, not the bolt. So all of a sudden, and this is uh, evidence from the case that we did. You step on it, tenants step on it, they fall through, firemen step on it, get jammed up with all their gear. Now, now you're fighting fires or rescue mission? We were going back up, right, during our case study and investigation. This is how much rust was on that fire escape that the firemen fell through. And as we're going up to look at the stairs, treads are falling underneath my feet. So this is all being videotaped and photographed as we're doing it on the fly. So the lawyers are there, their lawyers are there, and we're walking up this fire skate that almost killed a fireman, and it's all rotted. Except for those three treads that he fell through, those got rebolted. Two years ago. So as I'm going up and I'm stepping, I'm, I'm just stepping on treads, and I'm falling through again. I'm like, hey, dude, what's going on here? This, they, they didn't refurbish this fire escape, right? They sell the case. Um, let me just go back up one. All, this is the, the thing I talked to you guys about. I'm going to show you how fire escapes are built, but before we get there, uh, I just proved to you that fire escapes are rock from the inside out or the outside in. Everything starts at a connection. So you walk up to a building and the whole structure, rails are, rails are rusty, stringers are rusty, the grating is rusty. You have a paint problem or a structural problem? Structural. Because what you have right now is you know where it came from. Is it eating from the outside in or the inside out? And is every connection suspect? That's all you have to know. Do you know which one is suspect? Who's going to tell you? An engineer is going to tell you. But you know right now that every connection is suspect. You're going to immediately order a load test. What does that load test automatically bring in conversations? Right? Load test your fire escape. They're like, what? That's going to open up all the questions, right? Write a violation. Load test fire escape. Or you can write that other one that says repair, paint, test. Right? But otherwise, any call you get from the owner, any call you get from a structural engineer, any call you get from the mayor, any call you get from anybody, every fire escape must be load test. Or give me other satisfactory means to avoid the load test. So most codes, and again, I've got the book over here, and I'm going to pass the book around, because fire codes and building codes, and you guys are NFBA 5th, it's Quincy, right down the street from me, I live in Somerville, Massachusetts. I need some of you, one of you guys to tell me where you're gonna write your violation out of this life safety code. Because they say it's here. There's 107 pages of it. So can somebody tell me where it is in here? And then I can try, I can try. Oh, there you go. Please find it for me. In the meantime, let me tell you what every state code, what, uh, every building code and every fire code says. And, I, and once he tells me exactly where he would write a violation from, he's gonna give me some, does anybody here remember some of the code numbers they used to write a violation? Because then we can go right back to, the, to that. But let me tell you, this is New Jersey, ready? 1028.6, it's a fire code. So it's the, national, the International Fire Code of New Jersey, so they're using the International Fire Code. Let me read what it says, and I'll read it here off the, you guys have the tags floating around there, if I may. Let me tell you what it says here. I'll put your code right there on, your, on the bottom for you, ready? 1028, uh, this is actually the, built, this is a building code, and I'm going to read you the, uh, the, the fire code, ready? A building code out of Massachusetts says, testing and certification, all exterior bridges, steel or wooden stairways. Did I mention fire skips yet? So this is beyond, most of your code is actually beyond, it's all exterior egress, isn't it? 
Thank you. Where would you write your violation? Right, but what for, for the maintenance, where would you write oh, your oh. I need you to write me a but not to build one. I wanna I wanna repair one. If you found a violation or a problem, just point out the code. So right here, egress balconies are the fire escape egress balconies shall be examined or tested. What's that word mean? Examined and or tested. So who has that choice? The structural engineer or you? That it'll be examined and or tested. Very good. For stru structural adequacy and safety every five years by a Massachusetts registered, registered professional engineer or others qualified and acceptable to the building official, meaning can we send you credentials here for a fire escape engineer or fire escape inspector? And if you, don't, if you still don't like us, we, we piggyback with the structural engineer. And then said engineer shall then submit an affidavit or to the building official. Now that's a building code right here in your sister city. You may want to copy that and say, I want to use it up here because I like that building code. Let's take a look at the International Fire Code 1028.6. Exterior egress. All exit discharge. Sorry, I say fire skip yet? Exterior stairways. That cover all those dirty porches on the back of the building. And fire escape shall be kept free of snow and ice. Any fire escape or exterior stairway found to be in a state of deterioration or determined to be unsafe by the fire official shall be repaired immediately. Depending upon structural condition, a load test of any fire escape shall be conducted before the fire escape is returned to service. So, depending upon structural condition, who decides depending upon structural condition? A load test will be ordered. So, who decides and who can order? It's you guys. So, otherwise, stick with the word load test your whole life. Otherwise, you say the word, depending, because, you know, depending on what code they're going to pull out somewhere, and he's going to give me a code there because he's still looking for it. Because a lot of times the code will tell you how to build a new one. They won't tell you how to maintain it. But here's two building codes, a building code and a fire code, and they, don't they say the exact same thing? Examine it or test it. <coughs> and it says right here, depending on the structural condition, a low test of any, of any fire escape shall be conducted. So the, the word depending now is you're able to play with that word. How would you like to play with that word? Somebody has to go out of their way to satisfy you, don't they? So some structural engineer will make it, it it's, a, it's a priority for him. Just like your sprinklers are a priority, your smoke alarms, and your central station, and your fire hydrants, and you say, so what, can we, what, what are we doing about this fire seat? Oh, we're gonna scrape it and paint it. Goes, oh, an opinion. So it's in your, your opinion, it's good, it's not satisfactory. Just low test it then. Spot repair, give me a load test, call me the day you're going to do the load test. I want to see what it looks like on the ground. Well, you know, what's going on? You know, oh, 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 any other options besides load test? Yeah. You can spot repair it and then load test it and do this every five years. Or you just refurbish this thing because oh, you know when the last time they changed the roof over, right? You know when the last time they changed all these windows up. You probably know when they changed the boiler up. And yet this thing that's been out here catching rain and, and wind and snow for 75 years has all its original hardware still on there? Of course I want it low tested, because it's old. But if you refurbish it, you're not probably not gonna do I'm not gonna load test this thing or ask for a load test for another 25 years. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, he's got something. He found something. Fire escape stairs shall comply with provisions unless uh, approved for existing fire escape stairs. So that comes with any. And then read that bottom one of that third Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, the, authority, the authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any existing fire escape stair that has been shown by low test or other satisfactory evidence to have adequate. <laughs> We were we taught a class in uh, in Newport. They use the same uh, Rhode Island, and they use the same the whole state same book. And we asked, "Can somebody please, you know?" And so I said that this will most likely match. We just matched the words that I said there. Right? So your code. But by the way, write this down: seven point two point eight point six point two. I'll start again. Ready? Seven point two point eight 
0.2. You guys get one whole line. But basically, we just taught in this class. The authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any fire escape stair that has been shown by low test or other satisfactory evidence to have adequate strength. Did we say anything different in this class? So you, somebody calls you up and says, hey, there's a fire escape on Tremont Street, what do you want to do with it? You say, load test it. Or give me other satisfactory evidence to have adequate strength. Would a refurbishment satisfy you guys? Including the whole retying it back into the building, duplicating it or verification. So that's it. That's it. You guys have basically walked into. Thank you for showing this because now I gotta find this uh, piece right here. And everything else, everything else was all about building new ones. <laughs> and all of a sudden, one paragraph and how to fix it. And if somebody didn't explain that to you, didn't explain how much power you have. Yeah, that you must be satisfied. Because right now and then I have to satisfy a building owner. Oh, I, 30 years I've never touched this thing, I'm not going to touch it now, and that guy's crazy, and I'm going to call the mayor because the mayor's my third cousin twice removed. What are you going to tell the mayor? He doesn't have to fix it. He's just have him low test it. The code, seven point, da, 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 da. You know, what do you want? Not, not let the guy have sprinklers either? Give him a free pass on a bunch of other things. We're only talking about tenants and firemen's lives here. What the hell, man? You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, specifically in the code, I'm giving the guy a break. He can either load test it after he does some spot repairs as uh, under the advisement of a structural engineer, or he can just refurbish it because it is old. Well, what happened? Oh, the thing's only 25 years old. Well, then, the structural engineer photographing it, inspecting it, sat down with me and he showed me that, that the thing is only 25 years old. And I didn't order a load test because he gave me satisfactory evidence that it had adequate strength. So in this five-year cycle, I'm not ordering anything. The certificate will suffice. But that's the front fire escape, Mayor. The one on the back, in the alleyway, is 75 years old, treasure dangling, and this guy wants me to give a certificate for both sides. It ain't gonna happen. So all, that's what this class is all about, is finding where you have the power. So who has the power to oversee what gets done to a fire escape? The owner, the structure engineer, or you? It's you guys. That's all you guys need. We have the power. I'm sorry guys, so that's how deep it is into the building, eight to 12 inches deep. That's a cemented pocket, and that's it. That's what it looks like, okay? See, two staircases, dangling treads, and where's the brace? Somebody took it out and they put it back. As soon as you step on that, if it's only 8 to 12 inches deep into the wall, how much weight are you going to need to rip it out of the wall? This is the typical. It either has a single bolt there or it has a, a, a gusset. But it's still only buried 8 to 12 inches deep. This needs to be refurbished and that needs to either be verified or duplicated. This is what happens when water gets driven into the, into the, into the bricks. This is what it looks like on some of the interior of some mill buildings. They are through bolted, <coughs> but they start, the bricks start shattering because of the, uh, the, the amount of weight that's getting tugged on these things. Okay, they get sucked right in to the building. So that's not approvable. You can't little test that. You have to just duplicate the connection with, another, with a bigger plate. In case you want to grow ferns and you want to grow anything, fire escapes are a great place to collect, you know, just have the gutters broken, just have all kinds of crap constantly feeding water and you get you know, mold, you get, uh, what's this green stuff called? Uh, the algae and also the uh, fungus, and what's another name for it when you get green grown on a cement wall? What's, what's the other name for it? Moss. Moss and. So, fire escapes, that just does nothing but tear fire escapes apart. Look, all original hardware, okay? Square head bolts. This is one year of rust. How many years to get one year, one inch of rust on this library in the center of Boston? For kids. I said, you know, if you ever want to grow certain ferns and certain plants and 
not be caught. There's certain things, places you can hide your illegal uh, foreign factory, and fire escapes are it. Uh, and the other one is the leg to the ground, right? We talked about the building is a leg, the leg is a leg. Okay. And by the way, that's how I sometimes fix fire escapes that have rotten buildings and they can't, I can't get inside or do the connection. As soon as I put legs on it to the ground, I've eliminated the need for verifying the uh, tying in the back of the building. This is what it looks like when it's tied into the building. This is what happens when trucks smash fire escape. They rip the veneer. This thing's still buried in 12 inches deep. So you gotta verify, you gotta get all this cleaned out to see what, what happened on the inside, because a lot of guys will just repack it at the veneer. This is a through bolt on a wood structure. Every wood structure must have a through bolt with a plate on the inside. If you get there and you don't see a nut and a, th and a threaded rod cut and you just see lag bolts, and they usually the giveaway is three, four, five, six lag bolts into an angle, that means what? It's not properly attached. So all wood structures must have a through bolt. Otherwise, it must have a leg to the ground. Okay. Can levers. See the release arm. See when and the release arm just blocks your way. You actually walk right into it. It's idiot proof. You walk through a release arm, and it, as soon as you rotate it, it rotates down here with a little clip. And then this thing drops through to three feet per second. By the time you get down to the pivot point with your child, it's already hit the ground and stays down. That's a cantilever. Got it? This is a perfectly balanced Swiss watch. There's no release arm on it, there's nothing, and it is out of balance. Who's going to hit this? Trash trucks, moving trucks, you name it, they're going to hit it. And a lot of it is just over time, as rust grows inside the weight box, as rust grows on the tread, it gets out of balance. That's what a chain looks like when somebody doesn't want to come in the middle of the night and put it back up. That's what a release arm looks at it. And isn't a release arm that both grabs the top and the bottom an anti-theft device? Because now, can they pull it down from down below? But if it has a release arm, can they? Re These are always 12 feet off the ground, 12 to 14 feet off the ground. So can a release arm, isn't it an anti-theft device? Because when you get there, you need to get this thing down. Can't you just stick your pole up there and just wiggle it? Can't you put your ladder up there and just turn it and it'll start dropping by itself? You guys have that ability to get on. But this is also an anti-theft device. Weights get thrown on, things get smashed, things get broken. Trucks hit it. Look at this. Look at the chain. See the illegal chain? Look at the extra weight they threw on it. Trash trucks, things hit it. Top stringers, bottom stringers. Now a lot of times it's not your treads you have to worry about. It's the fact that the stringers that hold the entire staircase are all rotted out. Right? Now this is a 25 story hotel in Chicago. I think we got a problem there. This is me shooting with a long zoom lens. Who's that wait, waiting for? This hand grenade is waiting for the, the, the occupants of the building while they're coming down, or the firemen going up with all their gear on. Look how much rust is there, holding the entire string. Your treads may be great, but your stringers are about ready to give. And forget these things, you know. You're showing up in the middle of the night, the people coming down, falling through these things, and Forget one of these things conking you on the head. If you don't have a helmet on, just uh, one of these on your head, you're, you're out. You, now it's a rescue mission again. Because you've got pieces of steel embedded in people's heads. Things that got smashed that never got fixed. These are all over the place. Railings and how they tie in, rust. The next thing I'm going to show you guys is a couple of walkthroughs by other fire officials so that you guys can... Uh, Spacers in between the grating, they brought up. Rust everywhere. Yeah, you know, 95% of everything you're going to touch right now is going to require a little test. Only 5% of it will pass. And that's because it 
recently got done or recently got a new one put on because they didn't want to bother fixing it. It's much rust, it's ready to hold and this is a school in uh, New Jersey. I just replaced over the Christmas time uh, Matt Nahn High School in Cambridge, Massachusetts church uh, that they rented their building to a, a French group that built a, a school for kids, a one-story fire escape. So much rust on the treads. So much rust, on, it looked just like this. So much rust, rust on the string of the, that I actually saved it. So it's a one-story, and I actually slice it like a piece of cake. The top stringer and the bottom piece to use at my next class. So I didn't have time to prepare it, but in my classes I will actually have piece of fire escape here with the railing, the support, and everything, and three quarters of rust in it. This is a fire escape that was at a building that kids use every day from kindergarten to sixth grade. Teachers use it every day, but here's the worst part. Firefighters, fire inspectors, and building inspectors walk that building every year through that fire escape to do their year, their annual inspections. And they just replaced it. We have to have it done in by the by uh, January 3rd, and only because the facilities guy said, let's get this done, because this thing is ready to hurt somebody. But it was such a good example that I actually saved the first top two treads, plus some of the supports, and the bottom stick that was into the tar, was all rotted out. I saved it to make class. So my next classes will have a piece of steel here with photographs of the school and saying, this was active as of this year, 2011, and we, we spent three weeks during, not three weeks, uh, we had 10 days during the school break the fabric, build it, install it, but it's going to be here for you can do the, the touchy-feely and understand in full how long rust takes to grow, but also why low testing and a full refurbishment are the only answer to give you the guarantees you're looking for. How much rust for that tread? That's a hanging egg, just waiting to take some of the leg. Lattice for the ground. Everybody able to see one of these? Out in California, call it an accordion ladder. It'll actually open up into a ladder. But they don't have any freeze and thaw issues there. That's why it happens that we can't use it. This is what a typical weighted balanced ladder will be in, your, in some of your back alleyways. When you release that, it drops two to three feet per second and hits the ground. Otherwise, it comes down any faster. It's a guillotine. Is it acceptable by law to have guillotines? Ladder over the roof. These things must be secured for you guys. Nobody's climbing up fire escapes, only you guys. So these ladders must be confirmed that they're in good condition for your firefighters to get up and basically blow a hole in the roof so they can air and stop the uh, ventilation process, correct? These are also illegal. People have modified their ladders. Instead of putting weights on them, they, they, they basically cut them in half and made it so it flops out. So we call this Thor's hammer. So when you push this out, or some little kid's playing up there, or the wind blows strong enough, but you take that ladder and you go like this, and there's a cat, a dog, a kid, or a fireman down below, and this thing comes out like Thor's hammer in a nice arcing arc swing. What happens when the tip of that ladder gets you on the head? Drive you like a nail into the ground. These are illegal. That's what it looks like in a down position. And sometimes they even have a chain on the end, so you have to like, let, out, let it out so slowly, you know. Is that a single action requiring no special knowledge? Here's your fire escape plan. Ready? And we'll help you with it. This year, everything's going to be, you're going to be helped through the National Fire Escape Association. So every document you're going to get is not going to have fire escape engineers or fire escape services on it. It'll have the National Fire Escape Association and links back to that for any industry standard documentation. But we'll Basically, through the National Fire Escape Association, we, we do free classes like we do here. We'll work with you freely online, and whenever possible, when we're in your area and visiting, we will help you by giving you the confidence test with a name already on the top. Because we do this every day. We'll give you tags with your name and your seal on it, because we do this every day. That's how we build our report. You're going to know who we are, and we're qualified because we're going through all these steps to give you the information you need to make sure that there's at least one guy in town that can inspect properly, and that's us, but we'll give you tax, confidence tests, repair guidelines, low test criteria guidelines. We're going to give you that book that is basically the one inch or two inch binder with the CD of this class in it, 
and you just stick it on your shelf. And whenever you have a question about how to build fire escapes, how to inspect fire escapes, what a proper inspection looks like, just pull out your book, and put it up. Otherwise, a lot of the video that are sitting on the CD, because some of you guys are forbidden to be on the YouTube channel through your local whatever, whatever, you just pop in the CD during your once a, a week classes that you guys have, or once a month classes that you get with your people, and you will basically watch this, this class and many other classes, because a lot of times in a CD I'll put up to six classes. Watch as many of these, but they all say the same thing, but it's also, also nice to see what others, since I may say something different in another class. So, let's take a look at some of the plans. Aside from uh, you guys as fire inspectors looking at buildings, uh, do, do your firefighters do pre-plans throughout the city? Those guys are going to become your fire escape watchers. We took, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, we trained 400 firefighters in a four-day four period. They just rotated in, we did a one-hour class, and all we're doing is making them part of your spotters. Now, are we doing an inspection program in the city, or are we doing an awareness program in the city? Awareness. Do you want every fire escape, because it's a local uh, requirement, not a local requirement, you're doing a uh, departmental procedures. Uh, you guys may have it as a different name. How do you make something that you want to do it as a norm in your city? What's that called? Do you call it departmental procedure or a Guideline. guidelines? It's a document you just created. It's not code, right? It's just, I'd like to see it done this way. We have a great document for you. We'll make it and it'll have your name and your phone number and your contact information. We'll make that for free for you. And it has three guidelines in there. How to inspect it, how to repair it, and how to paint it. And it's all general. It doesn't tell you what bolt to use. It doesn't. It just talks about remove all the rust. In lieu of a load test, that's the kind of language you put in there. Okay. So now with that, with that document in your hand, you got your firefighters to do pre-plans. And their job is to identify where the fire escapes are. So they're at one main street, but there's no fire escape there. But behind them is what? A fire escape with no tag. The captain uh, of, the, of the squad basically gets notified that at 3 Main Street, there's a fire escape there. That's all he needs. Who does he notify? Fire inspector. Saying, we've identified that at, at um, 3 Main Street, there is a fire escape. You ask him one question. Painted or unpainted? Or is there any life safety issues that you observed? Painted or unpainted? Any life safety issues that you observed? And he says, it, it wasn't painted. Any life safety issues? He goes, no. So you're going to go out with what color tag? In your general walk-arounds, because you know, you'll, you'll put that on your schedule to do. You're going to put what color tag on that? Yeah. The yellow tag. That's it. The tag speaks for itself. And then in your process through your computer system, you will send a violation out. Saying what? To inspect the fire escape? Or are you looking for the last certificate? Do you want a copy of the certificate? Yes. Last time it was inspected. That's all, right? So are you ordering a load test? I mean, or, or an inspection? Not yet. This is an awareness program, yeah. right? We just want, as part of our now our new guidelines for the city, we'd like a tag on every fire escape. So we just want, for the next three to five years, to find everyone so we can have a nice number. There's 767 fire escapes identified in our city. And everyone must have a tag, like an elevator tag, of its condition. So minimally, you're going to get either a yellow or a red from us to start the ball rolling. And whether that person takes six months or six years to finally get to it, do you care? Of course, you're going to care afterwards because somebody took six years to get that. Is there fines, penalties, and fees? As soon as you write a violation, do you have that ability to assess fines and fees if they're not, if they're not on top of it? Daily fines, per diem kind of things? So you can make a fire escape that as soon as a tag goes on there, if they react within the first 30 days and get it started, they don't have to finish it within 30 days, but if you can just, if they start contacting you within the first 30 days, there's no fines and penalties and fees. But if they leave it alone and they're going to ignore you for six years, you got a lot on your plate. What are you trying to find in the first one to three years? The yellows or the reds? What are you going to work with in the first one to three years because you're very busy? you got a lot on your plate. What are you going to start attacking? All your reds. So you're just tagging everything. The firefighters that are doing pre-plans are always telling you, hey, I found another one on this building. I found another one in this, this lady's residential. I found another one here. I found a wooden one here. I found a metal one here. You just want to go out and tag it. Then you get back. You start the process of the computerization where a letter gets generated, and that takes 30 days for them to get it. They're going to call you, and you ask them for an inspection or for a current certificate, a copy of a current certificate. Right? Are you? Are you? 
pushing anybody to do anything? They should have been doing this anyway, right? So now you start it. So here's the, the, the start the plan. Start in the downtown. If you want, I can come down and meet you in your downtown and we do, what's, we do a two to four hour walk around. And we just walk alleyways. I'm going to show you an alleyway that I did a downtown walk around with the commissioner of the city of Lowell. Change the laws and regulations that make it every one to five years. You're going to do it starting with this, this guidelines and procedures. That's where it started. You want to make it a state code issue? Tell me who it is and we'll go together to the state so that the state changes its code and does it. But that's a five year walk up a hill on a cold day with, you know, with molasses in our hands, right? But that's okay. But isn't this great that you have this, as soon as you make it as, as a guideline and a procedure, it's sort of like helps you immediately get this thing under control and you have a document that says here where, you, where the code is, right? It doesn't say every one or five years, does it? It says every day you must meet this code. There's no one five year rule. Every day you gotta meet that code. You gotta show me that it's structurally sound. Or I can order a low test every day if I want to. Right? So, um, must be structurally sound, must be kept painted. That's what that said. I talked to you about the permit. You gotta work, uh, some of you do double duty, right? You're fire inspectors and building inspectors? Depending? Okay, so you need to bring your building inspector in on this, right? And have them do what? Not only take a class like this, because usually where, after we get the fire department on board, guess who else we make take a class? And if they don't want to take a class, guess what class we make them watch? Your class. So this class being recorded, we make them watch your class. But now, they're just going to help you with the permit process. Like I said, guy, any permit gets pulled on any existing structure, issue the permit. But to close anyone, I need you to identify whether they have an internal or external a means of egress and ask for a copy of the certificate. Are they ordering inspections? Are they ordering inspections if they're asking for a copy of the certificate to close the permit? Nope. Can they still close the permit and then make, notify you that they have a permit that didn't have that document that you asked for, which was a copy? So it doesn't, if the fact that the owner says I don't have one, doesn't that automatically generate a violation? On your part, not his? So he can close his permit, can he? He doesn't have to hold up permits. He can say, okay, uh, you have an external? External permit. Okay, it says I need a copy of your current certificate. Do you have one? No? Okay, that's a no on this box. By the way, the building, the firefighters are going to immediately contact you. So I'm closing your permit. Here you are. Things good.